Now, Connect Mental Health was founded in 2015 by Kieran McLoone to help raise awareness of mental health issues in South Donegal. Uh, through events, digital media and educational seminars, they aim to empower the local community to improve and maintain their mental health. Well, Kieran set up Connect Mental Health after his own personal experience with mental health. And as part of our Time to Talk Mental Health Week, Kieran, along with the head of the National Office for Suicide Prevention with the HSE, John Meehan, join us now to talk about the importance of mental health services for rural communities across Ireland. Well, good morning, gentlemen. Thank morning, you very morning. much for coming on. Uh, Kieran, if I could start with you and your own story, because as I said there in the introduction, you set up Connect Health after your own personal experience. So can you tell us a little bit about that and, and what life was like for you in your 20s? Yeah, well, I suppose uh, when I was growing up in my teens, I was always pretty anxious, uh, but I never really could actually put a name to it. I didn't know what it was. So um, would you be worried about big events or...? I'd be worried about uh, being asked a question in school even. Uh, I would have had a bit of a stammer when I was younger. So any time uh, like reading came up in class even, I, I would go into a bit of a panic. Um, and I suppose I always remember when I was in my teens, I always used to remember saying to myself, I can't wait until I'm 18 and I've grown out of this. But of course, you know, yeah, that's not going to happen unless you have some kind of skills to actually do it. But as things went on, I never really addressed it. Into my 20s then, you know, I you're growing up, I moved to Dublin. You have like different life issues that actually come your way. And I suppose what I found at like, different stages is that when certain things happened to me, I didn't have the skills to know how to actually deal with it. And I went through a few periods of extreme kind of panic uh, and anxiety. They would last maybe a couple of days to a week at a time. But I always remember saying the same things again. I can't wait until next week until this has passed. Uh, but I never really addressed it, never told anyone about it. And then in around my mid-20s, um, I experienced one of those periods again. And I remember saying the things like, oh, I can't wait until next week till this has passed. And it never passed. So this is around October 2011. And as the weeks went on, um, you know, I started realizing, you know, that um, I didn't know what I was doing, as in, like, I didn't know how to actually help myself. Um, I started feeling worse and worse. I started losing weight. Um, I couldn't sleep at all, maybe an hour or two, if you're lucky, but you're waking up then, you know, anxious, really anxious as well. And um, I suppose after about, six, after about six weeks or so, I kind of approached my parents. So... I was lucky in the sense that I felt I, I was able to talk. You had someone, yeah. I had someone to talk to. And, um, you know, from there, they started pointing me in the direction of, of some care. And um, I saw my GP and I saw some other people. But um, things kind of continued. You know, I was seeing these people, but I really, I was kind of reluctant, like I was advised to go on some medication at the time. But because maybe of the stigma around the whole issue at the time, uh, I was actually nearly afraid of the medication as well because I thought I'd be a zombie or something like this, which wasn't the right thought at all, but this is what was in my head. And um, I continued on and things weren't really improving for me. And uh, I remember after Christmas that year is when um, I started losing kind of hope at all. So that's, you know, when, you know, going on, you're kind of going, you know, yeah, things could get better, but as the weeks go by and the days go by, you start losing the hope that things are going to get better. I mean, you must have been exhausted by the whole thing at this You're, stage yeah. and losing strength to keep going. Yeah, exactly. So it's extremely taxing. You know, if, if you can't sleep, you can't really eat, you know, your heart, heart is racing all the time. That I, I, I suppose that's what it was like for me, you know. And um, it's just really distressing. And as the time goes on and you start losing hope, you see, you know, you, you start thinking that, you know, I'm never going to have a laugh again. I'm never going to enjoy watching the football again, which I'm actually... I, I'm like absolutely mad about that, you know. So, um, what brought it to a head? What brought it to a head was well, um, I suppose it was, it was about February of uh, 2012 when um, I, I suppose I was getting suicidal thoughts from maybe about two or three months in, but I was trying to 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 kind of park them and and like not engage with them. But as time goes on and as days pass by, it gets more distressing. And uh, the suicidal thoughts for me just kept coming, you know, until they were nearly always there, they were ever present. So uh, that's very distressing because, um, you know, you don't want to be thinking those thoughts, but they're ever present. And um, uh, so it, it, it was very difficult to deal with. And I suppose it came to a kind of a head for me, I suppose, in around January, February that year where 
I was seriously considering taking my own life. And um, Had you planned it? I had planned the weekend where I went home and um, I decided I would go out for, you know, seven or eight beers to like, build up some courage uh, to actually do it. And I talked to myself on the way as I walked out home that uh, I was going to do it tonight. And I, I wrote two notes uh, to my family. I went in, you know, uh, to like two pages of notes, but I, I wasn't able to go through it that night. I actually you fell asleep because I, I had a lot of pints, basically, on the night. Uh, but I woke up the next morning, and, uh, or just a few hours later, and uh, I had the two notes beside me on my bedside locker, but I didn't go and tear them up or anything. I, I kind of folded them up and I put them in a drawer because I was like, I'm going to need these anyway again. So that's the kind of negative thinking that was in, in my mind at the time. And are you thinking at all about your family and friends and the devastation that you'd leave behind, or is that not the priority at that time? It's, it's kind of hard to explain, I think, because for me, um, uh, uh, there was an uncle of mine who actually he took his own life. Um, he was in his mid-30s and he was a guard. He, 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 he was based in Waterford. So I saw the devastation firsthand that that caused in uh, the wake of that. But still, actually, when I got to the stage where I was feeling really bad... Um, Did you think they'd be better off without you? Yeah, well, it's, it's something that you think... Um, that you're doing them more harm and that everybody will be happier and better. I'll, all this will be over on my part and they won't have to worry about me anymore. Yeah, you feel like you're a burden, I suppose, you know, that, you know, that you're putting your parents through this or your family through this, when obviously they, they actually just want to help you. But in your own mind, uh, it's very hard to actually think that, you know. Um, well, I suppose from what you're saying, you're thinking it can't be fixed, but it can be fixed because, look, you've gone from not wanting to talk in school to going through that very dark time to talking now on television about how you have come through it and how you've set up Connect Mental Health. So how did you turn it around? Well, well, uh, for me, uh, actually, for, um, in around February that year after that, um, I saw a great therapist who was the first person who was able to actually convince me that, uh, that there was some hope. Um, and... I eventually was convinced to go on some medication. Now, I went on medication and after about five to six weeks, I was very lucky that the first medication that I tried actually worked because for lots of people, they might try different forms of medication and each time you try, it takes three or four weeks and I would actually know if, if it's going to work for you. And uh, I went and I started feeling really good again, but I was, I was taught a lot of things by my therapist at the time into how, how, how to actually keep myself well. But I kind of did the opposite, and uh, I was kind of euphoric that I was feeling well, and I started got drinking. Cocky. Got cocky, exactly. Yeah, as uh, we all do. I'm very complacent. Don't need any, yeah. of, these don't need any of these things. So I started drinking like I was before, and Donegal won the All Ireland that year, which didn't help add the whole drinking thing either. Um, but I went into I was on medication for about a year, but I stupidly in 2013 thought, um, "Oh, I'm grand now. I'll take myself off the medication." and uh, I basically went to my GP, but I didn't go back to my therapist or, uh, or the psychiatrist that I'd seen before. And um, slowly, gradually, like mid-2013, again, things started slipping for me again, and I went into that. Same thing, I suppose, looking back, I can notice now that, you know, all the warning signs were there, that I was going to slip back in, into a like, really major depression. But it got to kind of the stage where around Christmas 2014 where I sank back to where I was before. But actually, during the time that I was well, which, you know, it was, um, I always had this massive fear in the back of my head that, you know, this was going to come back. So it was a real fear thing there. So when that did actually happen in December of that year, um, I was really distressed. So I, I wasn't just distressed because... Um, I was feeling depressed. It was actually compounded by the fact that my worst fear... Yeah, that you're annoyed at yourself. ...is after yeah. returning. Yeah. So I was devastated that it was happening again, and then I was, you know... I was also properly unwell, you know? But again, I was very lucky that <clears throat> I was able to, to, to like go back to the people that I'd been to before, and they were able to set me on the right course, and, and, and the therapist I was seeing at the t time, um, he set me out a roadmap of things I needed to do, basically, and to follow. Um, and I started doing those, and gradually over time, like, I haven't drank in nearly four years, for example. Um, but doing, I like different things, even getting my sleep patterns right, um, and, and just learning how to deal with, like, life stressors, um, 
But those are all skills that I never had before yeah. that I had to learn from someone. And they, they, they make a very important point. I want to bring John Meehan in here. John is the Assistant National Director, um, Head of uh, the National Office for Suicide Prevention, HSE Mental Health Division. John, the language that we use when we're talking about this issue is very important. Mental illness is what people say, but in actual fact, it's more correct to say mental health because mental illness is a stigma that can follow people throughout their entire life. People can have an issue with their mental health recognise it, go and get it treated, problem solved. Well, certainly, you know, it doesn't have to have the tragic conclusions that being branded or stigmatised with mental illness has. No, and it's a good example, and I'd like to acknowledge Kieran for his bravery to come and speak Absolutely. today. And I think it's... Uh, we're from the same town, actually, uh, in, in Donegal. Ballyshannon? That's correct. Uh, and it's ironic we're here together today at two different aspects of it. We all in our lifetime would have suffered from uh, mental ill health in different various uh, sort of levels. And you're right, we talk about mental health well-being. And nationally, our Connecting for Life strategy, uh, one of the aims of that is to empower individuals and communities to look after their mental health and well-being. And you're right, it's taking the positive aspect of that, which is quite difficult in sometimes a community or in a, in a society that is stigmatised and... Well, take we your own county of Donegal, for example, which, you know, we know nationally it was possibly the hardest hit county in, in the country economically and lack of services, etc., 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 the whole ball of wax. So, you know, if it's, if it's a problem here, then it's a worse problem up there because you've got less services and you're, you're you know, further away from the centre. Yes, well, th there are services in every community. I think that's important and help is available. And I think the message must go out there. Uh, and in Donegal, uh, I suppose, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of the work that has been done there is reflective of actually what's happening throughout the country. And Kieran and myself met uh, a few years ago, and I actually didn't realise that Kieran had that experience. And w we met, uh, uh, and we went to the first fortnight, which is, um, happens every year, the first two weeks of January, where they, they talk about maybe mental health uh, and disabilities through the medium of arts. Uh, and Kieran shared with me his experience, and uh, like I didn't know, and I'd know his his dad, and I'd know all his family well, and I didn't even realise, even though I work within mental health services. So he began, and I, I was really taken back at the time how positively he wanted to put something back into Donegal, and particularly with young people to focus on young people. And that's how the conversation started with Connect Donegal. Well, can we yeah. talk about that then? You're on the board with that. And as you say, that's how you, you kind of came to meet again. You set that up. Why did you, Kieran, and what services did you want it to provide or message did you want it to get out there? Um, well, um, I suppose the main thing about it was uh, that I live and I work in Dublin. Um, but I, I wanted to uh, I do something positively. But I suppose I, I recognise the area that I'm from has been more in need maybe and you know all the things that you said about the lack of services and 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 like things like that in Donegal um but I suppose the main thing like it's not a service as such so we set it up in January 2015 at, after I met John that time and uh, the main thing was to act as a kind of collaborator because in the mental health services you've got different agencies you know you, you've got the likes of Aware, you've got Pieta House, you've got Jigsaw and all these guys. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to do, is not try and deliver another service because there was no point in actually trying to compete with someone else. It's just to bring some of those services that are already there. So there are actually great services there um, on the ground there in Donegal as well. But it's also to bring through some of the things like, for example, Aware have a great life skills program. If we work with them, we can bring that in into our community. It's a six week program. It's free for people to attend. And even things like, you know, because um, I suppose one of the reasons as well is I was very conscious when I was in Dublin, I had easy access to stuff as well. So I remember even on one occasion, I was feeling really distressed and I went to a, an aware support group, which was on Leeson Street. Um, and like that, that was a great comfort to me. But if I was in Ballyshannon, I, I wouldn't have had that, you know. Um, Actually, if you were in Ballyshannon, where would, be, where would have been the nearest place you could have gone? Well, just I, to give people an example of the yeah, difference. I suppose I, 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 the route would have been to go t to my GP. Um, at the minute now, actually, uh, Pieta House Donegal have just launched, uh, they only launched it there a couple of weeks ago. They're based up in Letterkenny. Um, so that would have been the route for me, I suppose, going to the GP. 
Well, listen, um, thank you for coming in and, and for staring, uh, sharing the, 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 the story with us. And I, I don't know how you're feeling, but I, I, I suspect that this wasn't the most comfortable situation for you to be talking about this in. But it's a, it's a measure of just how far you've come, because I don't imagine you could have done this three or four years ago. Yeah, no, absolutely not. I suppose uh, I'm really comfortable now, as I mentioned to yeah, you, about the fear thing before. I think once I kind of got over that, that was a major hindrance for me, you know, the fear thing, fearing this to come back. Whereas now I'm aware of my mental health and I'm aware of the things I have to do every day to like help myself. And uh, I just try to follow those. Um, and I'm doing pretty well, thankfully, at the minute. Absolutely. Well, it's a very important story to tell and for people to hear. And thank you very much thank for sharing it with we'll us. We'll put all the details up on thank our John, Facebook page as well. We'll yeah, take a break. You. See you back here thank in a few you. moments.